Now talking about credit risk mitigation techniques, which are frequently used by market participants. One is frequent exchange of collateral. So collateral is one component which plays a very important role in mitigation of credit risk. And one example of this is a CSA agreement. So CSA stands for a credit support annex. So imagine I am a bank and I have, let's say, five other banks who, who are my regular trading parties. That is, I trade with them very, very frequently. So in order to mitigate the credit risk which is embedded in the transaction, me and each of my counterparty banks, we uh, individually enter into five transactions. So let's say I have uh, one through to five, which are my counterparty banks. So I have individual contracts with each of them. So I have a contract with bank one, bank two, and so on. And these are what you call as a CSA agreement between banks. So the main idea behind CSA, CSA is to manage the exposure which the banks are exposed to each other. And generally, the frequency which you will observe for CSA these days is on a daily basis. That is on everyday basis, banks are going to keep on exchanging collateral with each other. And that is a cash collateral or a cash like. Generally, I would say it's more of cash collateral which gets exchanged. So at the end of each day, the banks will do their respective portfolio valuations and they come up with the quantum of collateral which is to be paid out by one party to the other. And this is what happens inside a daily exchange of CSA. And the idea behind this is we are trying to minimize our exposure to, uh, to each other so that if a certain bank has to default overnight, uh, we have a certain collateral payment which is there to make good our potential loss which, may be, which we may be exposed to. Next is netting of exposures. Again, now when we talk of exposure management, there are two ways of doing it. You can either have a crossing or maybe netting of exposures. So let's say there are five trades with a certain counterparty. So let's say I'm a counterparty A and I have five transactions with counterparty B. Out of this, let's say uh, three transactions, I am in the money and two transactions, I am out of the money. So likewise, two transactions, B is in the money and three transactions, they are out of the money. So in this case, what happens is imagine uh, we are looking at the first scenario, which we call as grossing of exposures or gross exposure technique. Imagine that my counterparty, which is B defaults. So this will imply that uh, I'll firstly lose on the three trades where I'm in the money because my counterparty has filed for bankruptcy. So they don't have any money to pay me. So I'll be exposed to that loss. However, the exposure on the two trades where I'm holding a negative position, I'm still expected to make this payment to them because this is because of grossing of exposures. The, the exposures are grossed up. So this mine, this two trades whereby I'm expected to make a payment to them that still is alive and I'm expected to make good my side of the trade. This happens for gross grossing of exposures. Whereas the second is netting of exposures, something which counterparties prefer. So whenever there's a netting of exposures, what we do is we combine all the five trades together and we come up with a certain quantum which is due from one party to the other. So we will just have a one shot payment which happens from one party to the other. And that happens under your netting agreement. So that we take all the five transactions, we take, uh, uh, so here we have three and two. So where I have three, I am in the money and two, I am out of the money. So that way we combine the two and we, come up with a final number which will dis and the sign of that number will basically tell me whether I am due the money to someone or whether I can expect that money from my from someone and that someone is essentially my counterparty. So this is what we call as netting of exposures and that is something which uh, is more of a market standard. Then the third way is to transfer the risk to a certain third party. So we can have a CDS or an insurance contract which can be entered into. Next you have bank guarantees or BGs as we call it. So uh, BGs are another way of credit risk mitigation. So imagine that two parties have entered into a transaction. Then uh, what the parties will say is we have a certain bank guarantee. So let's say two parties X and Y. So let's say Y has a certain bank guarantee. So Y will say to X that I have a bank guarantee which I hold. So in case I do not make good my side of the payments, my, my bank is going to make good uh, make good for on my behalf so that you don't suffer any kind of credit losses. And this is what you call as a bank guarantee. 
now an option for early termination of the contract so at times you may have a certain uh, transaction whereby an agreement might be made by the counterparties that uh, uh, if a certain event is to occur then there will be a certain option to terminate that particular transaction so uh, so generally as a part of your term sheet this will be clearly defined next is secondary market loans secondary market loans involve purchasing and selling of loans which have been originally created so this allows distribution of risk and also it allows uh, non banking participants to take position in such transactions next is loan syndication so when we say a loan syndication that implies that uh, we have a certain originating bank and you can imagine that there is a certain syndicate of other uh, investors or banks who may be interested in this particular uh, transaction which we call as a loan syndication so there are two ways in which syndication happens so we can either have a firm commitment or best effort So again, a popular technique for distributing the overall risk which is embedded in a certain uh, transaction, that is we are trying to distribute the credit risk across multiple parties. So if it's a firm commitment, then the obligor will, so whenever a bank is able to get firm commitment, that implies that the obligor knows the exact amount which is due. Whereas uh, if, the, if the number of subscribers in the firm commitment is lower, then the originating bank is going to hold a significant portion of that on their books but through syndication what happens is the originating bank is able to distribute the risk which is embedded in the loan transaction and this will be transferred to other uh, other counterparties or other interested parties i would say whereas if it's a best effort basis then this means that uh, the the originating bank will do all the due diligence which is required for this and will also support in the overall marketing effort for uh, that part, that type of a transaction. However, in this, there is no guarantee as to how much will be the amount which will be raised. So the main difference is for a firm commitment, we have a guarantee on the amount which is raised. So guarantee on the amount of amount which can be raised. Whereas here, there is no guarantee as to how much amount of loan value can be raised so this is the main difference between a firm commitment versus best effort basis so these are a few popular ways in which market participants try to mitigate the credit risk which is embedded in their uh, transactions